Hello, and welcome to today's live. So, today we're talking all about trauma, what it is, why it happens, and how we actually heal it. I think there's a lot of people that are actually aware now of what trauma is, but not really what to do about it in a, in a meaningful way to like, actually change your life. Because when I hear trauma, I hear people do, they say, like, oh yeah, I know I have trauma, I'm doing therapy. But the life kind of stays the same, you know? The health problems they have stay the same, the patterns they're stuck in stay the same. Nothing really changes, that's not really healing to me. Healing is seeing actually tangible improvements in your life. So today I'm gonna to talk you through how I've done this myself, how I help people do this, and how you can do it too, you know? Because if I can do it, and if I've seen hundreds of other people do it, you can do it as well. It's, it's quite, a, quite a scientifically based formula that's repeatable, you know? I see it again and again and again. So I'm gonna walk you through this whole process with like all of the science, all of the logic, all of the understanding of how it actually works and then how we actually do it as a step-by-step -step formula we've got down here. I look at trauma on, on three levels. So we've got, so th this is all about awareness, right? So we've got conscious, subconscious and somatic. So first of all, let's just, let's just break these words down so you understand what they mean. So conscious means like awareness. So this is like in your mind, you, you can think of it, you know? So you can think back to, I don't know, maybe you can remember like, when you did something at school and everybody laughed at you. You know, at, at that level, that trauma is, is conscious. So you, you have awareness of it. What I find happens in, especially the, the, the more, the deeper traumas, you, we can't usually remember them. And you probably know this is you because you can't remember much about your childhood. You can't remember much about your adolescent years. You've got big periods of just sort of like a blank, you know, can't really remember what it's like. And this is because it's, it, you don't have conscious access to it anymore. It doesn't mean that we can't resolve these problems. It just means that conscious work isn't, gonna, isn't really gonna make much difference because you're only working on the small narrow of awareness that you have. Subconscious is, so the word subconscious means, sub means below. So if you think like submarine, that's like a, a boat that goes underwater, right? Submarine means it's underwater, submarine under water. So when we've got subconscious, it basically just means under conscious. So it's, it's below your conscious level. So at this point, you're not gonna have much conscious awareness of it, but you might sometimes see some of these, these things like slipping up into your consciousness. So the way this might happen might be like recurrent themes in dreams, or you'll be able to perceive this as like fantasies that you have, or idealizations about the world that you have that you might start to perceive aren't actually in alignment with reality. This is, this is your subconscious sort of like bleeding into your conscious. Um, you'll also see this through uh, anytime you get triggered. So if somebody says something and it triggers you into a, an emotional state, that's usually where you've got some kind of subconscious disassociation. And we can also look for, for, for clues here, uh, looking for identities that you have so you know the example that i always use if you're one of my clients you've, you've heard this example already if you say i i love dogs you know i'm an animal person i love dogs but if you then observe your behavior and when you're outside every time a dog gets near you you start getting really like afraid and and, and bunched up and then when the dog tries to interact with you or lick you you get really scared you start to like shoot it away trying to kick it you've got a, a, a disharmony between who you think you are and how you actually behave. So you've got like this like discrepancy in who you are and who you are and who you think you are. And at this stage, trauma resolution is about meeting in the middle or bringing this, this behavior to your awareness or changing who you think you are to actual reality. So it's about bridging the gap between who you are and who you say you are. So that's when we're working there. Things that can really help with this are things like hypnosis. Hypnosis is a really cool thing for, for this, this kind of area because we have a deeper access to the subconscious. And you know if you have trauma, there is, so let's walk, let me walk you through how we know if we have trauma here. So consciously, you'll know if you have trauma because you become aware that you get stuck in, in thought patterns and, and behaviors, you know? So things like ADHD or OCD, you might be quite aware that you have these tendencies and you don't know why, right? So there's, at this point, there's a, there's a part of it you're aware of, but then you're also not exactly sure why you're doing it. So we've got a part that's in the conscious and a part that's in the unconscious, in the subconscious. So at this point, you, you might have an awareness of like certain things, like maybe you like procrastinate, or maybe you know you have an addiction, but you don't know why. So when we come down to the subconscious, this is a really good example of, of where we can see that you have you have trauma is if you're exhibiting any of these behaviors. 
So first of all, we have self-sabotage. So this is where the part of you that you're identified with wants to get a new job, wants to find a partner, wants to do something. So this is the part that you're identified with. And the other part of yourself that you're not identified with is afraid to ask for a raise or is afraid to go and experience social situations for some reason or another. So there's a disharmony. And this looks like self-sabotage. It's not really self-sabotage. It's more, a more accurate word would be self-preservation. So the, you, your subconscious is trying to protect you from going into an environment that could be potentially traumatic again. We've got procrastination. So this again is a, is a split. You've got one part of you that wants to do something and another part of you that doesn't. I find one of the most common things that happens here is we kind of live in a society where we, we're really praised for working ourselves to death, you know? Self-care is not important in, this, in, in most societies nowadays. So often what's happening in procrastination is we're trying to keep up with societal expectations or the relationship expectations that we've established and our need for self-care is greater. So instead of doing the things that we've told ourselves we need to do or the things that won us approval from our society or from our close friends, family relationships, we prioritize our own self-care. And this looks like binging Netflix, this looks like playing video games, this looks like all, whatever activity it is that you use to procrastinate whatever it is that you're doing. So this could be like scrolling on TikTok or YouTube Shorts. It could, it could be anything, you know? You can procrastinate anything. You can even procrastinate important parts of your work by doing less important parts of your work because they're less, they're less challenging, you know? And this is because you, you, there's a part of you that wants to feel motivated, but there's also another part of you that isn't able to extend itself to, the, to doing that thing that's actually meaningful. So that's a, another really good, good clue. Addiction is a really interesting one. So this can be addiction to anything. This doesn't have to be hard drugs. It can be, so this can be like heroin, this can be alcohol, but it doesn't have to be. This can be addictive tendencies. This can be almost without thinking, opening your Facebook and checking your notifications. This can be constantly refreshing your thing to see if you have any new, new notifications. This can be video games, this can be food. This can be types of behaviors, risky types of behaviors. This can be anything, you know? A tendency to do to, to do a behavior that you don't really have much control over. At this point, it's quite subconscious. You're not really aware of, of, of necessarily why it is you're doing it. Under here, we've got manipulation. So if you feel like you need to manipulate people to get them to do what you want to do, that is a trauma response. You're not able to authentically express your needs and have them met directly by others, so you have to manipulate them to do it. So if you find some good clues here around this sort of theme are things like becoming aware that you manipulate people. You might, this might not be completely subconscious, you know, so you might not identify with being manipulative at all. But if everybody around you believes that you're manipulative and you don't think you are, then there's a good likelihood that you probably are and you're just not aware of it. So things like manipulation, um, lying. Lying is also a really, a really interesting one because you're not authentically expressing yourself and lying is a form of manipulation, even in the really small white lies. You know, that is a trauma response. So we've got manipulation, we've got other types of behaviors where you just aren't expressing yourself authentically. So there's a, there's a really interesting one that's kind of like a, I think it's called like chameleon syndrome. So it's like you're a different person depending on who you're with. You know, you can completely change your identity when you're around other people. This again is a trauma response. And finally, we've got eating disorders. So this really depends on the eating disorder. It's quite a broad category. So I think with things like anorexia and bulimia, it's, it's quite obvious that that is really connected as a, as a trauma response. Something that I don't think a lot of people realize, and this was actually the case for me, is eating disorders, they can also manifest on the somatic level down here. So we've, we've been covering these two, but we're starting to, to dip into the somatic now. So in my case, the eating disorder that I had was something called ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. So this is a disorder where you avoid eating certain foods for fear of the negative consequences of eating those foods. And you might think like, oh, well, I eat this food that I have a food sensitivity to and I have a reaction. That's like a physical, a physical thing, right? That's just a physical reaction to the food because I can't digest it. That may be true, you know? In my case, there was elements of that. There was elements of like, this is just not digestible for me right now. But on a deeper level, this was a trauma response. And by, by actually working on this trauma at the somatic and the subconscious level, I was able to get to a point where my body stopped reacting to foods. And it was really quick, you know? It, it, the, the speed of change really leads me to believe that there was a, a strong emotional component to this. So 
The thing about ARFID is we've usually kind of got wires crossed in our, in our brain and in our nervous system, and we connect certain things to certain negative consequences. So this might have happened in the past, you know, we did a certain thing and then a negative thing happened, and then we now avoid that first thing and almost in a, in a way kind of make that secondary thing happen. So when I would eat the food, I would have the reaction. And it was all somatic, you know? This wasn't in my conscious. This wasn't even in my subconscious. This was somatic, you know? I wasn't aware that I was afraid of food. I thought consciously, I had a really good relationship with food, you know? Being a health coach, helping other people heal their health problems, you know? I'd actually helped other people overcome their food sensitivities while I was still on a restrictive diet of five or six foods. And this is because the people that I was helping had the problem on the physical, which I'd, I'd, I'd aced that, you know, figured it out. It's, really a lot simpler than the nuance of this. Not not simple, but simpler, you know? It's sort of more like one plus one equals two. Whereas this is really big mathematical equations, lots of stuff, and a lot of it you can't even directly see. You know, that's that's the thing with trauma. It's a lot harder to, to see and logically understand because trauma isn't logical. It doesn't make logical sense. So I'm at this point where I, I, I'm still having a really restrictive diet and I still have food sensitivities and I've helped other people heal their food sensitivities. A really interesting place to be. And by working on this trauma side, I was able to literally in the span of one day. So, I mean, I was doing the work for like five years beforehand with all of these different techniques that I'm going to talk about down here. I was doing all of this and laying the foundation for this breakthrough. But I went from in the space of 24 hours having food sensitivities to everything. I literally had a diet of like five or six foods. And within 24 hours like that, I could eat anything, you know, I had Ben and Jerry's cookie dough ice cream with gluten, with dairy, with sugar, with everything, you know, I could have coffee, I could have pizza, I could have rice and bread, I could have everything, you know, and there was an emotional connection here. And I can tell you this now, and this is why I want to speak about this, because I just worked on the physical stuff for so long. And this is why I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in bringing more awareness around this somatic component to emotional trauma because it's so deep, it's so deeply repressed and suppressed, it's a physical expression now. We're not even conscious of it. We're not even, you, it's very difficult to even see it uh, observing your behaviors from yourself. But if other people are saying like, you have a weird relationship with food, and you're like, yeah, well I have a health problem, it's like, both can be true, you know? And there may be a, a side of this that you need to work on. But what's really important to understand is, if this is, Say this is like ARFID, especially a somatic ARFID type situation like myself. You can't work in the mind because you're not aware of it. You know, you have to work where the trauma is. And if it's a deep level and it's reached the point of it being somatic, you have to work on a somatic level. You have to work with somatic based modalities. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So how do you know if you're at this somatic component of, of trauma? Really, the only way that you can know is you have physical symptoms in your body. So if you have any kind of like health problem in your body, physical symptoms, especially the ones that are idiopathic. So these are the ones that aren't, aren't easily diagnosable. So maybe things like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, IBS, the kind of medical conditions where the doctors are like, well, we don't know what the hell's going wrong. Like here's some medication. It might make your life a bit better, but we don't really have any solutions. Those are the kind of illnesses that usually have a root in trauma. And that's why they can't find a solution because the solution isn't physical, it's, it's emotional, it's a, it's a trauma response. So if you're in that camp, this might be something to investigate for you. Also, if you even if you have been able to get a diagnosis and you've been prescribed treatment, if you've had like five rounds of treatment and it hasn't gone away, and when I say treatment, I don't mean just like traditional mainstream medicine, I mean like naturopathic and alternative holistic practitioners, you know? If you, so like, if you've, if you've had a SIBO and you've treated it five times and it doesn't go away, there's probably emotional root. If you've had some kind of hormone imbalance or like something that has been treated by a professional that actually knows what they're doing and it doesn't go away, there's a good likelihood it has a root that's further than just the physical. There's probably some somaticized emotional trauma that's contributing to that situation. So with that in mind, like, how does, how does this happen? Like what, what happens that causes us to take emotions that are traumatic in the experience and suppress them into our body? Like, why do we do that? Why would that make sense, you know? Because I truly believe that the body is intelligent. It doesn't do anything stupid. It only does the smartest thing every single time, you know? So that makes you think like, well, why is this a smart thing to do? You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense if it caused me to have a chronic illness, but it, it is actually smart and I'm gonna walk you through that now. 
So when we, when we experience one of these heightened emotional states, it puts us into a flight, fight or flight nervous system state. So I'm sure you're familiar with what this is, like maybe you're walking and someone scares you in the dark or when someone makes you jump or I'm sure you've had something scary happening in your life. There's a tendency to either to fight or flight and you'll either run away, you'll either try to get out of a situation or you'll try to, to, to like fight back, you know? And the, the, what option you choose is very much determined by what worked better for you in childhood. And more often than not, it's flight, you know? Because if you're trying to have a fight with, and you're like four years old, and your dad's like, like 30 or 40, or even like 20, you know? He's like five times bigger than you. You're gonna lose that fight. So the instinct is to run. Sometimes we can't. And if we're in a situation where we can't fight or we can't fly, so what usually happens is we go back and forth. You know, like, an, like a dog that's scared, for example, it usually will respond with aggression and then it will try to run away. And if you corner it, it responds with aggression again. It's trying to look for a way out, but it doesn't have an option, so it's trying to fight. But if it feels like neither of those options are, are viable, neither of those options are gonna help it to survive, then the body moves into freeze. And what happens in this state is we've got all of this energy in the nervous system. So fight or flight nervous system state is the, the most highly energetic state that your body can go in. You know, your body is mobilizing so much energy because it's trying to preserve your life, you know? So your stress hormones are like up here. Your blood pressure and your heart rate are up here. You know, everything is on maximum. But then you go into freeze. So all these things come all the way up to the top and they get frozen there. And they're just stuck here. And staying in this state of an extremely mobilized nervous system is what causes these kinds of chronic illness. If you get stuck in this freeze state and you're never able to come out of it again, you get stuck in a, in a somatic expression of illness because your body has engaged in a hyper-aroused state and it got stuck there. Some really good clues that this is you, that you've had this kind of situation occur, is you have some kind of autonomic nervous system dysregulation. So the, the, the best way you can tell that this is a problem for you is you find it really hard to wind down and relax even if you're like, so this was, this was me, right? I would be in the countryside in a really quiet house and nothing's happening, everything's peaceful, you know, I can hear the birds chirping outside, there's literally no danger at all. And I'm laying in my bed and my heart is like and I, my mind is racing and I can't, I, I can't calm down. And at the time I'm like, well, this is just normal, you know, because that's kind of what I'd had my whole life. But having had the contrast of what it's supposed to feel like to be in a more, and I'm still not there, right? It's a, it's a progression, you keep, you keep de-escalating. But now that my nervous system's not up here all of the time, it would be nice to be down here, but I'm kind of like here, right? I know what this contrast feels like, and I know what hypervigilance feels like. So in this state, especially if this is like some kind of somatic thing, you might be really hypervigilant about what's happening in your body, you know? You might be tracing the symptoms through your body. For me, it was like I would eat something and I could feel when my stomach would open and move into my intestines and I would trace every single bowel movement and then I would feel strong emotions towards what was happening inside my own body. And I had this like hypervigilant awareness of what's happening here and what's happening around me. And in this, in this state, your body is super mobilized, but also really rigid. So you might feel like really emotionless. You might feel depersonalized, depressed, anxious, because you're stuck in this hyper aroused state, but you're also kind of disidentified from it because you're in freeze as well. So this is happening and you're not even really aware of it. When you're in this state, all of the normal systems in your body get deprioritized. So your immune system turns off, your digestion turns off, um, like blood circulation and temperature regulation turns off. All of the, the, horm the, um, the word is uh, homeostatic response. All of the homeostatic responses that your body has, they just get disabled, you know? They're like, screw homeostasis, we're in a fight for our life, let's just turn everything up to max. And your body can only do that for so long. And once it holds that state of hypervigilance for such a long time, it just burns out. It doesn't have the resources anymore. And this is the onset of chronic disease. So at this state, when you go into freeze, and you're not able to get back out, it somaticizes and it gets stuck. It literally like freezes inside your body. So I like to use this analogy of thinking of emotions and this trauma process as different stages of, of, of water. So you've got gas, you've got liquid, and you've got solid ice. So when it's, when it's a gas at the top, it's really free flowing, it's intangible, you can't see it, right? You can't see your emotions. They're just, 
Like, where are they? Like, I'm having emotions right now. Like, you can't see them, but they're there, right? It's the same as gas. I know there's gas in the room. I know there's oxygen. I can't see it. This is the state that emotions are supposed to be experienced. But if in a situation you can't experience it like this, they begin to become condensed. So on this liquid plane, where we've got the, 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 the gas has sort of become to start to liquefy, you can start to see it, you know? And the way that you would see this is you would be able to maybe become aware or perceive of disharmonies between who you say you are and who you think you are. You can observe behaviors, you can observe all of these things, you know? So if you have self-sabotage, procrastination, addiction, manipulation, and eating disorders, this is kind of that liquidish level where you're not really able to fully experience it as an emotion, but you're able to perceive through observing how you behave. And then finally, you've got this ice level at the bottom. And at this stage, it literally crystallizes and becomes solid. And just as ice is like a solid, like so is your body, right? So this emotion that was, that was intangible is now solidified, it's crystallized, it's formed ice inside your body. And depending on what you were experiencing, depending on how you processed the trauma, depending on where you were in the trauma loop when it got closed or when it, when it didn't manage to finish, it's going to manifest in different ways. So for some people, it's, it's gut and digestive for, uh, pain and dysfunction. For some people, it's chronic fatigue syndrome. For some people, it's MS. And sure, there's an element of your genetics that play into this, but there's more, it's more about metaphysics of what your body perceived what was happening at the time to mean and how you're going to now express that emotion because the emotion is a form of energy and you can't destroy energy it has to it has to flow somewhere it can't be destroyed it can only be transmuted or or, or moved along so if you're not able to express your emotions as emotions as this gaseous state that you have to express as a liquid as these kind of subconscious behavioral patterns or physically in your body as a symptom. This is the emotion expressing itself. So how do we get out of this situation? Hopefully you understand like why all of this happens and like how it's actually a really smart thing. You know, your body is doing the best it can to help you survive in a situation. It's a survival mechanism. And if you're watching this video, as bad as it sounds, it worked. You know, you are still alive and that's what's important. It worked. So that's great, you survived. But now you're becoming aware that you're stuck in this loop and we need to break it. We need to get out of this cycle because it worked, but it's not working anymore. You know, it's not the best way that you can live and you want to find a new way. So, so this, is, this is where we go. So I find that if we're at this point where we're experiencing this somatically, you cannot work on any kind of modality that is not somatic in nature. You need a somatic modality. So me personally, I use something called SRT, somatic release technique. This is a technique that I have built myself over the last five to seven years of my, of my healing, my, my, my trauma recovery journey. So it stands for somatic release technique. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring whatever it is that has somatized inside the body, trauma, emotion, and we're trying to release it from this, this ice, this crystallized state back into liquid and gas, which is where it's supposed to be. And when we do this, physical health symptoms disappear. All of these kind of behavioral patterns here, like for example, I had a client that I worked with, he had an addiction and we, we, we did some sessions of this. He learned how to experience these emotions in a healthier way. Addiction, lifelong addiction, gone. You know, you don't need to do it cold turkey. It's not about willpower. If you don't need the tool anymore, you don't need it and it goes. And it's, it's I wouldn't say it's effortless because he's trying to find a new way to do things. But it's different, you know, it's not willpower based. It still takes effort, but it's not just about willpower and abstinence. It doesn't need it anymore. So if I'm, if, if I'm talking to you and you have experienced an addiction in the past, you know that even when you abstain from the addiction, the desire is still there. You know, I've struggled a lot and still do struggle with addiction myself. And just abstaining from the substance that you're addicted to doesn't solve the problem because the desire is still there, you know? But when you work on this and you really heal that, that trauma, that root wound, the desire goes. And then it's not about making yourself not do the thing. There's just no desire to do the thing. You know, that's really what healing and addiction is about. So we need to start on a somatic level. There are other practices that you can use for this. So a really good example of, of one that I really like is somatic experiencing. If you want to learn more about that, you can look up, I think his name is Dr. Peter A. Levine of the Somatic Experiencing Institute. That's a really cool modality. I really like that. I based a lot of my work on his work and research. So I really like that. Some good examples there. You could also read a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Also a really interesting book. But the, the key takeaway here is it needs to be some kind of somatic modality at this point. 
hypnosis isn't going to cut it. Talk therapy, CBT, EFT, these things aren't going to cut it because we need to work on the somatic level. So SRT is, is what I use, it's what I use myself, it's what I use with my, with my clients. You can look at things like somatic experiencing. There are lots of different types of, basically you just want to look for the word somatic. The word somatic means of the body. So any type of somatic modality, somatic therapy, it's like a modality or therapy of the body. So it means it's, it's body focused. And that's, that's where you need to start if you're in this freeze state, if, it, if you're at this point where you've got physical symptoms, you know, you have to start here because all of these other therapies that I'm gonna talk about afterwards, they can be really helpful, you know, they can be profoundly helpful, but you can't work on things you're not aware of. And if the thing is currently somatized, repressed to a point where it's only expressing physically inside the body, you can't work on it because you're not aware of it. So SRT and the other type of somatic therapies help to melt that ice and bring it back into its other states so we can do other types of work with it. The next modality that I really like that I would progress to is, is something called family constellations. This is a therapy that I found. By the way, I'm going to talk about a lot of different therapies. I've done almost all of them. You know, I've, the reason that I'm making this video and that I have so much authority in what I say is I have jumped through all of these hoops myself. You know, I know this process intrinsically as I've been through it myself and now I walk other people through it and I can help them assess like where they are and what step they need help at. And then they go and do it and they get the results, you know? Like I've, I've been, this isn't my first rodeo, I've done this. So the next place I like to go after we actually have some dialogue with these emotions, when we're able to experience them instead of just as, as physical symptoms inside the body, we're able to communicate with these emotions as thoughts and feelings. So as the liquid and the gas stage, we can start to try something like family constellations. So the reason I really like this is it helps you to become aware of distorted perspectives that you have built about how you fit into your family and your family dynamic. And this has been really profoundly helpful because first of all, the first seven years of your life is where most of your trauma comes from and that's all with your family. So as you can understand, we need to work where the problem actually is. Family Constellations is a great, a great way to do this because a lot of this trauma comes from your family. And the way that we continue to behave with these patterns like the self-sabotage, procrastination, addiction, manipulation and eating disorders, they're usually because we have a warped perspective of, of our family, our family structure, who we are, how we fit into our family and the role of, of what it is that we're supposed to do. And this, this follows out into the, the relationship that you have with your family and how you fit into your family dynamic has a knock-on effect on the relationship of all the other relationships in your life. But I don't just mean relationships with your, with your family and your, maybe like your spouse and your, your close friends. I mean your relationship with food. I mean relationship with your own body, your relationship with God, your relationship with how you fit into this world. All of these relationships are, the, the, pers the perspective is built on the foundation of the relationship you have with your family. And if that family perspective is warped, it's going to warp all of these other perspectives of the relationship with your, with your food, with your body, with your spouse, with relationships, with how you fit into the world, with your career, with your worldview. So if we fix this at the level of where the warping is actually happening and we change that, it, it has a knock-on effect and changes how you perceive the world and how you fit into the world and the relationship that you have with your body, with food, with, with the world, with God, with all of these different things. So we can't really do this if you don't have a somatic level of understanding because you, you, can't, you can't talk, you know? You can only talk if you understand language. So we need to learn the language first and then this really starts to focus on the, on the root of where these patterns of, of, of behavior that we developed were picked up and how they helped us survive in our, in our family dynamic. So there's some really common things here. I'll, I'll, I'll be a bit, um, a, bit, a bit open and tell you a little bit about how this has helped me. So my mum my and dad both had their own, their own illnesses, their own problems. And for my mum, for example, I, in a way, took a lot of responsibility for her illness and tried to in many ways sort of like become her own dad you know i'll try to help her regulate her emotions and try to soothe her and she's my mom i'm not her dad and picking up that warped perspective changed my relationship with all women throughout my whole life because i felt like that was my role because that's what i'd been taught my role was in childhood but through this therapy i started to become aware that that's a warped perspective changed the relationship 
that I had with my with my mum from there. So not only did it change that relationship actually directly with my mum, but it also began to change the relationship that I had with all women and what feminine energy represents, you know? Like feminine energy is is the act of being able to receive. So this is like receiving love, receiving money. Like there's a strong metaphysical connection between the individual in the family and the warped relationship you might have with them with all of these other aspects that are metaphysically connected. And you heal the, the, the wound with the family and all of the other things have a positive knock-on effect. So this, this is the way that I would suggest and I encourage most of my clients or anybody that is following this model. Like if, as I've been going through this, you're like, oh, this makes sense. Like, oh, this is me. Oh, this is, this is really good. Like, I, this makes a lot of sense. This is the direction that I would encourage you to start with SRT, somatic release technique or some other type of somatic modality. And then once you're able to communicate with your body again, so once you know how to talk the language of emotion, we can start to use that new language to work on changing the, the narrative that you have of who you are and how you fit into your family. And when we do that, it has profound effects on, on all of the other relationships that you have. At this point, then I find it is helpful to try the other types of therapies. So this could be things like the EFT and tapping, this could be CBT, the lightning process, hypnosis, all of these other kinds of, of therapies. This is, if you're at this stage where you've done this and you've done this, that is where these things are gonna be really beneficial. If you're trying to do these things before you have set a good foundation, you're gonna get, you might still see improvements. And this is by no means like the ultimate guide for everyone, you know? I'm sure that there's at least a caveat out there that says like, this isn't the way that I need to do it. In fact, I can actually tell you, I've worked with a client that this method does not work, you know? So this isn't for everybody, but I would say this is for the vast majority. This is like a 90% kind of thing. There's always exceptions to the rule. And if you're getting results doing whatever it is that you're already doing, keep doing it, you know? I don't, I don't care, I don't care if you do it this way. I care if you get the results, you know? That's what I want, I want you to get the results. So if you're already getting results not doing it this way, like power to you, keep doing that, you know? That's awesome. But what I'm trying to do is help the people that get stuck, you know? Because I didn't. this wasn't the first thing that I landed on, you know? I tried loads of other stuff. And I wasted so much time and I wasted so much money. And I just want to save you that hassle, you know? The money thing is obviously a, a big thing, right? Saving money is, is helpful. But the biggest thing is time, you know? Because you're not just wasting time. You're, especially if you're like me, you're spending time with a chronic illness that makes your life unlivable, you know? You're not, it's not just a matter of, I've got some of these patterns and like, oh yeah, I'm an alcoholic and I know that's a problem, but I still have a functional life. Like for me, it was like, I am so ill from this trauma, I cannot do anything, you know? I cannot work, I cannot cook for myself, I can't contribute anything to society. I basically just wish I could die every single day, you know? And you don't have to be there for this to be helpful or, or appropriate for you. But that's where I was, and that's what I'm really trying to save people from, you know? That kind of pain and unnecessary suffering, because it is unnecessary. If you start doing the work, you, get, you start seeing results, you know? So I would really follow this model. Start with the somatics and the body type exercises, move to the family constellations, I find is really, really helpful, and then start looking at the other types of therapies. These are, and I say other therapies because I find these are usually more of a conscious oriented therapy. When, I hear, when you hear the word therapy, the thing that comes to mind is like sitting in the doctor with a, with a shrink, you know, with a psychotherapist or a psychologist, and they're like, tell me about this. Oh, how did that make you feel? And you're like, well, I don't really have access to any of my feelings because they're all expressing as somatic symptoms in my body. It's like, well, you, that, that's pointless. You know, you're not getting anywhere. And that's why a lot of the people that do get referred for, say, like myself, have a chronic, chronic health problem. And they're like, oh, well, we think you're depressed. It's like, well, duh, <laughs> I can't, I don't have a life. You know, I'm just completely debilitated by chronic illness. But talking about it doesn't really help, you know, because that's not the level that the trauma is experienced and that the trauma is being held and that the trauma is ready to be processed. It needs to be a deeper level than that. So SRT is the deepest you can go. You know, you're working on the somatic bodily sensations. At this level, you don't even need to have any conscious awareness of what the trauma is. You don't even need to know what emotion it's associated to. It's purely physical sensations in the body. So this can be tingling, this can be burning, this can be discomfort. This can be tension, this can be pleasurable feelings as well. This can feel like bubbling, this can feel like tingling, this can feel like different things, you know? You can feel energy moving around, you can feel your stomach moving in a knot. Like, there's so many different things, you know? I've worked with so many different people 
and the way that they describe their inner world is always so different. It's such a beautiful thing to see, you know? Walking somebody through, helping them create space for their body to heal itself is such a magical thing, you know? It's so, so cool to see. And this is why I can speak with so much conviction about this process, because I've seen it, I've done it myself, I've seen it with so many people, you know? And this is, a, this is an ability that the body has. This isn't something you need to learn. This is something the body already knows how to do. But what you need to learn how to do is to create a space where you allow the body to do this. It already, like I'm telling you right now, your body already has these instructions inside it. It already knows this process, you know? The art of SRT, the, the art of somatic release technique is, is actually an act of doing nothing. It's, about focusing your awareness on what's happening inside your body and stopping doing everything, you know? Stop trying to do anything and just let your body process what it's already holding. And then you do that and it does it, you know? Your body knows how to heal itself. It has all of the mechanisms built in to do this already. It knows how to do this. So all we need to do is create space. And if you're at this level, a somatic modality is where you need to start. So, I hope that's given you a new awareness on this situation. I hope this helps you actually have some tangible steps of how to heal trauma. You know, it's a thing you can actually do. So how can I, how can I help you now? So first of all, I have a resource. I have an ebook that I'm working on updating over time. It's called Integrated Somatic Release Technique. It's a free ebook. If you want, if you want a copy, let me know. I'll leave a, I'll leave a thingy down below as a, in the description or as a comment or something like that. So you basically just download it. In it, it walks you through this process in, in a more wordy way, helps you understand this in a, in a little bit more detail. And there's actually a guided meditation exercise so you can get started doing this by yourself. It can be kind of hard to start on this somatic level doing this by yourself because obviously you didn't somaticize this emotion because it was an easy thing to feel. So it's gonna elude your awareness and this is why it can be really helpful to work with a practitioner. But if you wanna get started, I can send you a copy of that book. I'll leave you a, a little link below. All you need to do is put your email in and press go and it'll send you a copy, to, copy of, the, of the book. I hope that's been really helpful for you. If you have any questions, let me know. I really would love to answer your questions. I say at the end of every video, I almost never get a question. Let me just tell you, there are no stupid questions. I answer every single one. I'm here to help you and you have to be willing to receive help and I'm not gonna be able to give you an answer to your question if you don't ask it, okay? So just ask the question. Whatever it is you're thinking right now, oh, I wonder about this, oh, I wonder about, just ask me, okay? And I'll answer it for you. So that's everything for me today. Hope you found this really helpful. You can heal, it's absolutely possible. Don't accept a life less than your best life. That's everything for me today. I'll see you soon. Ciao.